So when I was a kid, I did not want to be a scientist. I didn't play with toy chemistry sets or Rubik's cubes or learn to code as a sarcastic teenage hacker. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to write murder mysteries that combined the elegant twists of Agatha Christie with the political wit of George Orwell. But I did recognize that good stories don't arise in a vacuum, and I needed something to write about. So somehow I wandered my way into becoming a cryptographer, which is a person who studies ways of securing private communications. And I'm going to take you on a brief tour of the world of cryptography today, and we're going to meet some interesting characters along the way. So first, let me introduce you to Alice. Alice is a character that computer scientists trot out in order to illustrate a point. So she's usually given some eminently realistic and relatable task, the solution to which conveniently hinges upon the computer science concept being illustrated. So in our case, we're going to imagine that Alice has got to rescue a bunch of kittens who are trapped in a cage on a boat about to go over a waterfall, <laughs> the base of which is littered with nuclear warheads. <laughs> Now, tragically, Alice is not close enough to rescue these kittens herself because she's fallen down the rabbit hole. So she needs to get an urgent message to Bob, who is currently lounging on the banks of the river, blissfully unaware of the kitten's plight. And it's crucially important that this message be uh, protected against eavesdroppers who might be trying to listen in because, of course, there's an evil supervillain who is trying to kill the kittens as part of a master plan to take over the world. And to make things even worse for Alice, there is another character, Earl. Earl works in the rabbit hole IT department, and he's not very good at his job. <laughs> and the only line of communication between Alice and Bob is, is managed by Earl, and there's no telling what he might do. He might introduce a bug into the code that's supposed to process messages. He might choose a weak password and leave the system, system vulnerable to eavesdroppers. The possibilities are endless. And since Alice can't predict all of the infinite ways in which Earl might behave, either ac accidentally or maliciously, this is very scary. So when we think about the landscape of cybersecurity attacks that we're hearing about every day, we see that Alice has fallen down a very bleak rabbit hole indeed. But all is not lost, because our heroine has a superpower. A superpower that allows her to see structure in domains that would otherwise seem incomprehensible the superpower of mathematical reasoning that allows her to conquer infinities. See, we normally think about math as a convenient way of describing or calculating things we already intuitively understand. Things like calculating the volume of a three-dimensional shape or the tip on a restaurant bill. But it's so much more than that. It's more than just a tool for speed and precision. It actually expands our capability to conceptualize the world. And it's a good thing that Alice understands this, because she's also facing another very relatable obstacle. A henchman of the evil villain has followed her down the rabbit hole and challenged her to a mathematical duel. See, he claims that he's found the largest prime number, and he challenges her to prove him wrong. And this is important because it's another crucial step of the master plan to take over the world. <laughs> so you may remember that a prime is a number that's only divisible by one and itself. So, for example, 7 is a prime number uh, because we can only get 7 by multiplying 1 times 7. We can't get 7 by, say, multiplying 2 by something or multiplying 3 by something. Uh, it's a number that you can only get uh, by multiplying it by itself. And in this way, prime numbers are the building blocks that all other numbers are made out of. And 7 is a small example, but we know some pretty large primes. Uh, the evil henchman, for instance, uh, challenges Alice with a, with a prime that's over 22 million digits long. But this just happens to be the kind of prime that an evil empire could find with a lot of brute force and computing power. There isn't like a formula for the next prime number, so it's really hard to actually find them. And unfortunately, Alice left her supercomputer in her other purse. Uh, so she's got to do something else instead. She's got to somehow prove there are infinitely many primes, and therefore any particular prime that the henchman has found cannot, in fact, be the largest one. So to see how Alice is going to do this, let's consider a small example. Imagine, for instance, we had the first five primes, and that was all we knew. So we knew about the primes 2, 3, 5, 7, and 11, and we imagined that maybe there weren't any other primes out there. Now, what this would mean is that all other numbers would have to be built out of just these five basic building blocks. So every other number out there would have to be divisible 
by at least one of these five factors. So let's see what happens when we multiply them together. Okay, so if we multiply these numbers together, we get a new value, 2,310 in this case, that is divisible by each one of our five uh, prime factors. So it's a multiple of two, it's also a multiple of three, and so on. So let's consider what happens when we add one to this. So when we add one to this, we get a new number, and we've thrown everything off. So this is no longer a multiple of two, it's no longer a multiple of three, or any of the other primes that we put in in the first place. So to see why this is true, think about the fact that the multiples of two are separated from each other by a distance of two. Right? You can't add one to a multiple of two and reach the next one. It just doesn't get you far enough. And similarly, the multiples of three are separated from each other by a distance of three. So you can't have something that's divisible by three and then one plus that number also be divisible by three. It just doesn't get you to the next multiple of three. So this new number that we've created, uh, 2,311, it can't have any of these same divisors, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11. It's not a multiple of any of them. And hence, it must be made out of some new prime material. It either must be a new prime itself or divisible by some new prime factors. And we can generalize this reasoning to any supposedly complete set of primes. So if you think you found all the prime numbers and you've written them all down, you can simply multiply them all together, add one, and you get a new number that must lead you to a new prime factor. Okay, so Alice, of course, explains this carefully to the evil henchman. <laughs> and he has the unfortunate duty of having to report back to the evil supervillain that there is this crucial flaw in the master plan. But luckily, all this talk about primes jogs Alice's memory, and she remembers another important fact. The prime numbers provide a function that's easy to compute and difficult to reverse. So it's, it's relatively quick to take two large prime numbers and multiply them together, but it's a very computationally difficult problem, if you don't know the primes that went in, to just take this large composite number and factor it into primes. And this fact is the basis of the RSA encryption system, which was invented by Rivest, Shamir, and Edelman. And it allows Bob to choose two prime numbers that only he knows, multiply them into a public key that he can, that he can send to Alice, and Alice can use this to encrypt her message in such a way it's easy for her to encrypt it and to send it to Bob, but only Bob will be able to read it. Because for someone who doesn't know the secret factorization, they would have to solve this very difficult mathematical problem in order to read the message. And even evil empires do not yet have this capability. But this doesn't quite fully solve Alice's problem because it protects her message from eavesdroppers, but she's still got to worry about Earl. Because Earl might just lose the message completely or corrupt it so badly uh, that even Bob can't read it. At this point, Alice is pretty frustrated and decides to take a more drastic approach to the situation. She decides it's time to, have, to hire an assassin to get rid of Earl and force some new blood into the rabbit hole IT department. But this poses a new uh, communication problem because assassins are a very tricky group to get in touch with. So for many years in Alice's world, uh, the skilled assassins each operated independently, and nervous customers who wanted to make sure that their hit was carried out would communicate with each of them individually, and this would lead to some serious problems, uh, such as overbooking. <laughs> so in order to avoid these kind of awkward situations, uh, the assassins decided to band together into an organization called the Assassin's Guild. And they manage their secure communications with a new technology called attribute-based encryption, which was introduced by Sahai and Waters in 2005. And in the attribute-based encryption scheme, the assassins are each issued credentials according to their uh, weapons expertise and their price ranges and so on. And Alice can simply browse her assassination options, come up with a criterion for the manner and price of Earl's demise, and encrypt that to the guild, which is much more efficient uh, than communicating with each of the assassins individually. But what's even more interesting about attribute-based encryption is the mathematical problem that arises in proving its security. So for a basic encryption scheme, where we have a single secret key, it's relatively easy to reason about why, if you don't have that secret key, you can't read the message. 
but in an attribute-based scheme, you have all these different credentials floating around, and you need to make sure that they can't be combined in unexpected and nefarious ways. And this is important, because we certainly wouldn't want Alice to end up with an unqualified assassin. But luckily, mathematical reasoning comes in as a superpower in the form of X-ray vision in this kind of case, and allows us to see a complex attack surface and reduce it to a simple mathematical core that we can study the security of. And so we now have attribute-based encryption schemes that we can prove are secure in the sense that any violation of the intentions uh, of the scheme would correspond to breaking this core fundamental mathematical problem. And so what that means is that uh, even when there's infighting among the assassins, the encryption protects Alice's criterion for the assassination, and she's matched with someone of the appropriate skill level. And all of this is bad news, of course, for Earl, who is promptly assassinated. And good news for the kittens, who are promptly rescued by Bob just at the last minute. But of course there has to be a catch. You may be wondering, why is it that we've had secure encryption schemes like RSA for many decades, and we're now able to build ever grander and more flexible schemes so we can still prove security, and yet all you hear about in the news are stories of things being broken. And it's not really that mathematical breakthroughs have endangered the core technology of encryption. We still believe factoring is hard. Uh, but rather, it's the fact that Alice emerges from the rabbit hole to find Bob and the kitten safe and well, but also to discover that they're walking along the Maginot Line and the forces of the evil villain have been approaching from the other side. Because the problem is, we can't really kill Earl. There's a little bit of Earl in all of us. It's still human error that typically breaks security, uh, whether it's shoddily written code or weak choices of passwords or heads of companies not understanding how or why they need to invest in, in cybersecurity. And so, and the reason for this is it's a very difficult problem that we have on our hands here as, as scientists or researchers. It's even more difficult than understanding math. It's understanding people. We need to build systems that account for, the ex for their expectations, their usage patterns, and their idiosyncrasies. And so what this means is that uh, there's great potential in academic research, but mathematicians and computer scientists can't sit on the side and leave practice to the practitioners. We need to get our hands dirty and go out and investigate real systems and how to prove them for real people. So in other words, Alice's quest is not over. We're not living in the part of the story where the heroine triumphs. We're living in the part of the story where the heroine is besieged by new threats on all sides. Because you see, today there's so much work that's left for us to do. Because our, all of our political systems, our healthcare systems, our financial markets, and even our social experiences are becoming increasingly integrated with technology. And that technology has the potential to positively transform our lives, but it also opens us up to new threats to our identity and privacy and basic rights that we can't even yet anticipate. So this is not the time to, uh, to cling to theoretical models that aren't working in practice, but nor is it the time to abandon the powerful tools that scientific reasoning can give us. We all could really use some superpowers right about now. Thanks.